Great. Introduction. Uh, yeah. So the core discussion topics that I wanted um, to focus our discussion on. A uh, quick review of some of the key concepts that underpin Shea's Southern's political thought. Uh, briefly outline um, Shea's the Southern's theory of political action. And the key part of the discussion will be around Shea the Southern's structure, the structure of the Islamic State. Um, and I'll touch briefly on alternative interpretations of Southern's political thought and debate some of the gaps in political, some of the gaps and weaknesses in his theory with you guys. Um, I was hoping the way we would have this is very much up to you. So I'm going to try to go, go through as much of the material as quickly as possible and then leave time for questions and answers and, and, and discussion. And so we can delve into so many of the topics I'm going to cover very briefly in greater detail in the kind of discussion session. And that's, that, that becomes kind of down to you which topics you think are more interesting than others. Um, what are we not going to talk about? Economic thought. Amazing topic, far too expansive, we can't cover it today. What are we not going to talk about? So there's broader philosophical thought, things like logic, etc. Too complicated, can't cover it today. Theology, jurisprudence, all these kind of subject matters. I, uh, detailed comparisons of Sheikh al-Sadr versus other Shia or Sunni scholars or versus other Western political thinkers. We'll touch on these, but again, nothing too tangible. And they deserve to be kind of presentations of their own. And what we definitely will not talk about is Iraqi and Iranian politics. <laughs> Always fun, but I don't think it should be the core of our discussion today. Um, we'll make, again, brief references where relevant. Approach, as I said, first part of the session. Do we have an hour? Do we have an hour? Um, an hour? Less? 30, 40 minutes. 30, 40 minutes. Fine, we'll do it quicker than I expected. Um, first part of the discussion, um, just go through some of the key concepts, etc lay the groundwork for then hopefully the area where we actually have the Q&A and the debate. So I will <coughs> steamroll ahead. Sources, there's three key texts, I'm not going to mention them now, we don't have time, but as well as these three key texts that I spent a lot of time going through when I was doing an article on this, um, there's loads of works of Sheikh Dostada, we can mention right at the end if people are interested, that I drew on. The argument in a nutshell, I think just make it easy, and it's good, we don't have much time. I'm going to actually start with the conclusion. There's no suspense here. Present very quickly what are the different opinions of different scholars on Shea the Southern, then what's my view, in very brief, kind of succinct points, and then I go on to explain the political concepts and look at this, the, the actual structure to you know, explain why I got to the conclusion that I did get to. So, Sadr is proponent of uh, Khomeini. Uh, very basic view, very popular, particularly in Iran, um, but also in Najaf, among some scholars, that Sheikh Muhammad Bakr Sadr essentially was just an advocate of Imam Khomeini's theory of relative faqih al mutlaqa The key point here that we need to understand is that a lot of fuqaha, they debate the extent of authority that they essentially have over the people. So it's not, everyone has some kind of wilayat al faqih The question is the extent. Imam Khomeini was unique in that he advocated absolute wilayat for the faqih So those who say that Shahid al-Sadr is like Khomeini, they're basically saying he believes that the manager is um, the one and all in the Islamic State. One scholar who argues this, um, on the, uh, on, you know, that this is Shahid al-Sadr's view, is uh, Dr. Talib Aziz. You can find his journal articles. One quote, for instance, he concludes in his doctoral dissertation, uh, analyzing Shay Salah's work, he says the jurist is therefore, in realistic terms, an absolute ruler. You can read the rest of the quote. Essentially, it's a totalitarian system. For Talib Aziz is unique in that he, say, he says all the time that was Shay Salah's view. You have a completely opposite thesis, which is the constantly democratic thesis. This is, a, to be honest, a much more creation, I think, of post-2003. Uh, Dr. Sam Haddad is one person who's written about this. Dr. Ali Saleh, you may have heard, has good lectures about this topic. This view basically argues the exact opposite, that Shahid al-Sadr is all about democracy, and his vision is a liberal democratic vision, based on some concepts that we're going to go through later. The more nuanced opinions. Um, the early, well, this title is wrong, but this basically should say that this is the change thesis. 
So you have different scholars who argue that basically Shahid al-Sadr changed his opinion by comparing his early works versus his late works. So changed his opinion, two different stance on this. Uh, Shaykh Muhammad Baq al-Hakim argues that Shaykh al-Sadr, yes, he was democratic initially. Um, Shaykh Muhammad Baq al-Hakim was initially a member of the Islamic Dawa Party. So he's read one of the key documents we're going to look at that's very clearly democratic. But Shaykh al-Hakim then says, you know what? Dawa came in his mind, he changed his mind. He wrote to me a letter saying, oh, I'm having problems with the theory. And eventually, Muhammad Baq al-Hakim concludes, Shaykh al-Sadr became a full advocate of Walat al-Faqid al uh, Dr. Mohsen Kadabar argues for an even more convoluted story. Uh, he says that his ideas essentially went through a dialectic process, if you like, Marxist terminology. In the first stage, he was purely democratic. Then, second stage, completely changed his mind, went all the way to essentially Walat al-Faqid al He calls it Walayat al-Fuqaha al the assigned general rule of the jurist is basically the same thing. And then he kind of thought, nah, actually, I sort of like my old theory, and I'm not really sure about it. I know, let's go somewhere in the middle. And that's kind of returned to more, more democratic vision, that's kind of somewhere in between. So, uh, my opinion, I called it Islamic, Demo uh, Islamic democracy. Um, I guess I'll talk about it in greater detail. The few elements where I try to be different is the following. First, most of the scholarship, as I said, was narrowly focused on that question of the faqih. There was often ulama or maraja who were writing this stuff. That was all they were concerned about. I thought the unique thing about Shaykh al-Sadr, if you read his works throughout, is that he actually deals with very important political concepts linked to but independent to this subject. And so if we're trying to say what Shaykh al-Sadr's political theory, we need to talk about these political concepts. And I'll show that how, once we dig into these concepts, actually we realize this idea that at least he was uh, always you know, pro-authoritarianism, totalitarianism, completely doesn't make sense. So political concepts is important. And then the second part is detailed te textual analysis of the three documents that I briefly mentioned, um, are the core of kind of the Islamic state structure. Um, I did that, we're not gonna have time to go through it today. And then the third point, um, sort of kind of high level, that I, I thought it's important to mention now, is distinguishing between theory of political action, how do you get to the point that you want to get to, and the point itself, what is the ideal Islamic state? Lots of sc scholars unfortunately conflate that. So you can believe, for instance, that change is democratic, the process of change, or that change is revolutionary. A manager needs to lead the way, the same way that Malcolm Khomeini, for instance, led the way in Iran. But that's actually distinct from the point of then once you've won, once you have the people with you and you've overthrown the dictator, what do you do next? Shaykh al makes that distinction. Lots of commentators on him makes it all up, and so the picture becomes messy. What's my argument? My argument is that on, on the distinction between the two, Shaykh al definitely changed his opinion on political action. We'll see why. But on the Islamic State, um, the actual structure, the actual methodology, his journey was much more about filling it in. He had this idea from day one, and he started explaining it more and more and more. And it's one that I think is consistent with broadly Islamic democracy. I'll define that later. Key concepts. Very quickly whiz through, and then we can spend more time on any of them if you like in the Q&A. Vision of Islam. This is a really important point. Shaykh al-Sadr's worldview is that Islam is what he calls a complete concept. He believes that the Qur'an um, and the Hadith give us answers to absolutely every single major question we can think of. And so he says Islam is a holistic and complete concept because it is composed of a complete system of beliefs in creation, stemming from which is a comprehensive social system that encompasses all the aspects of life and satisfies the most two important needs. What are the mo those most two important needs? Ideological basis and social system. His life is literally living that belief. The, this quote, by the way, is from um, uh, Al-Usus al-Islami and Hizb al which he wrote the, the, the Constitution. But you will literally find this. Um, I have references for it in Falsafatuna, in Iqtisaduna, in some of his earliest works and then in his later. He's always believed that you can discover any major system, hence Iqtisaduna, hence Falsafatuna, hence his ambition to have Ijtima'una, which he never got to write. So he's coming from that vision and then he's saying it's our job to actually discover it. It already exists. We just need to do the research. 
man. Uh, what's, what's man for Shade of Sutter? It's not that unique, a uh, dualistic concept. Man is both a materialistic and spiritual being. We, we see that same view from Tahari and several other Shia thinkers. One key verse on that topic where I have a translation somewhere, but roughly translated, Allah is saying to the angels that I will create man or inni, surely I will be creating man from um, mud. Um, in Hamad that I will shape into the shape of man. And then I will blow in him or through him uh, my soul. So you have that uh, constant tension for Shahid Sadr in, in, in every one of us between on the one hand our materialistic being and on the other hand our spiritual side. Our spiritual side is where he sees the intellectual activity. And it's our spiritual side that propels us forward, that allows us in his view to, to strive for the absolute, the absolute being uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's man's nature. Human history. Now this is a really positive, important um, part of the story. Uh, Shaita Sadr basically believes in Toynbee's vision, which is that the trend of history overall is spiral. So you can have setbacks in history, you can have you know, civil wars, and world wars or whatever, but if, if we look at the uh, great extent of the way history moves thousands and thousands of years, it's moving upwards. He bases it on this verse, Ya ayyuhal insanu inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan fawlaqi. It's an amazing verse, this, if you actually think about it. He says, let's stop and think. Why is Allah saying, Ya ayyuhal insan? This is not, O oh, Mu'minus, this is not, O oh, Muslims. This is, Ya ayyuhal insan. Inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan. Inna ka, in Arabic, it's a statement of fact, and it's emphasizing it. Surely you are. This is not maybe, this is not, you know, if you try out, this is, this is an absolute statement. Innaka kadah. Kadah, the verb in Arabic, is to labor something that is toiling, it's kind of, it's full of hardship. So you're laboring um, towards what? Ila rabbik. Kadhan famulaqi. And so you will meet him. This is the amazing bit. He's saying, look, this verse isn't about man or, you know, a certain person or a certain society, whatever. This is the philosophy of history for you. That ultimately we're all trying to improve, and we are actually improving over thousands and thousands of years um, towards towards Allah the Absolute. Any improvement in technology, science, organization is essentially getting closer to Allah, because Allah's ultimate perfection. This is this the story of human history. Liberty, another really important political concept. Ultimately, I can summarize it to say he believes in both negative liberty and positive liberty. If you, know, if you don't know the difference, negative is simply being free from uh, chains. If, if I'm not imprisoned, I'm free, I can, I can do whatever I like. Western political thinkers, a lot of them, particularly the British school, this is what they go for. The most important thing is negative liberty. A lot of the German thinkers and a lot of traditional Islamic thinkers believe in this notion of positive liberty. Positive liberty is, is essentially having the knowledge, having the awareness, having um, to fulfill yourself in the way that you should. So, for instance, the argument goes, if you're a heroin addict, you're not really free, are you? Well, you are free negatively. There's no one imprisoning you uh, if, you know, if you haven't been caught. Um, but you, you're not free in the sense that your internal desires control you, essentially. And for Shahid al-Sadr, this is the really cool bit, he absolutely praises, in an essay on liberty, the achievement of the West. He says this was actually a great achievement of the prophets. I have a verse here, I'm not going to read it, but if you actually look at it, um, chapter 7, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 157, it mentions that one of the missions of prophethood is freedom, literally freedom from chains. So he says what Europeans have done is great when they rebelled against feudalism and against the church, but that's not enough. That's the, that's the kind of discussion. What you need, he says, going back, if I know how to, how that, uh, full liberation depends on freeing man in the first place from his servitude to the base desires which reside in his self. Go back to that definition of man we just looked at. You've got the materialistic and spiritual. Well, if you want the real man, if you want that story of history and progress to happen, well, you need to have some kind of framework that encourages us to grow the kind of spiritual side of us. Islamic law, um, didn't have really much time to fill that slide in. So, um, Islamic law, 
again, important uh, distinctions he makes. What he calls the Hakam al Thabita, which are fixed laws, translated, and Ta'alim, Ta'alim instructions, in another way you can understand that as policy. Uh, the two distinctions here are fairly obvious. He says there's absolutely important fundamentals of the law that you can never contradict. They're very straightforward, they're very clear, they're very explicit. These are Hakam al Thabita. Then the majority of other things in life uh, operate in this area called Mantaqat al Faragh, literally in Arabic, the area of space. Mantaqat al Faragh, he says, is actually not accident. Allah didn't just forget to talk about all these things in the Quran or in the Hadith. He deliberately left it there because Islam and the Quran is there for throughout and until the day of judgment. And so the idea is that. Because you believe in man's rationality, because you believe in man's ability to reason and develop over time, you, you give people the freedom to make mistakes, but also to grow and learn to create legislation. This legislation is ta'ali. It's, what, it's discretionary. It's not there clearly in Islam. Today, something could be Islamic uh, under ta'ali. Different context tomorrow, it's not Islamic. That's... That's the Islamic law aspect, which, which is clearly obviously important for politics. Uh, Marjaya, Shaykh al Sadr, was a marjaya, spent a lot of time in Hausa teaching. He completely revolutionized the uh, education system. But he also wrote very strong critique of the structure of the marjaya. He argued for the need to have what he called an objective one. What is an objective marjaya? It's institutionalized. You don't have, and he, he criticizes explicitly, you don't have an informal court of advisors who run the affairs of the manager without much transparency. Instead, you have what he argues, you need to have committees for everything, and it's institutionalized, it's modern, and the leadership is collected, and it operates its decision-making based on the concept of shura. Clear example of democracy in action within the manager here. Yeah. So these are uh, quick whiz through of the um, political concepts. Now, very quickly, I'm going to go through theory of political action. Essentially, what you have, um, Shaykh al-Sadr's writing internally for Hizb al -Dawr. He helped found the, the party. The relevance of this is not in the, in the politics of today. It's trying to explore his thought process. He has all these phases, which you can very simply understand it as gradualism. He says that change needs to happen bottom up. You don't overthrow governments. You don't. You you change the masses. You get them religious. You get them interested. You spread the word, and then eventually, this is in marhal al fikriya. Then you you get into marhal al siyasiya. Sorry, where you're you're persuading people. Fikriya is where you're um, actually defining what your concepts are, and you're 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 clarifying your knowledge, and then eventually you get to rule. Now, obviously, why doesn't that happen? Because we live in Saddam Salah. And so the key quote he has in 1972, he says, when we live in a democratic country which believes in respecting its people, you can go on to, to read it. Basically, you're free to, to operate, to organize, you're free to, to publicize your ideas, no one's going to do anything. Two, in Iraq, we simply can't do that. We get killed. Hezbo Dao was crushed, the Communist Party was crushed. And so he's looking at this and he's thinking, okay, there's something wrong with my theory of this faction. This is 1972. You then go to the late 1970s, and suddenly the revolution is happening in Iran, and Khomeini's leading it, and Shaykh al thinks to himself and says, you know what? Actually, maybe I was wrong on this. I'm too theoretical. We need to be more pragmatic. The Marja'iyya can lead the change. The Marja'iyya has resources, financial. It has spiritual resources. It commands much more authority than a democratic political party. So you suddenly see a shift in his argument from political parties lead change, to Marja'iyya leads change in times of oppression. And that's uh, what I've described as the revolutionary term. I'm going to stop for a second before I talk about the Islamic State and say, already, if you think about it, look at political concepts we just talked about, liberty, we talked about, we haven't had time really to talk about justice, but similarly, a uh, basic argument about its importance. You already see, for me, uh, outlines of, this is not a totalitarian state, nor is this, only the Marja knows best. Because even the idea of a single most knowledgeable Marja is one that's disputed by Sheikh Hassan. He's talking about institutionalization, he's talking about collective leadership. Now we look at the Islamic State itself, um, and this is where the textual analysis comes from, from three key documents. Briefly, the three key documents I mentioned. The first one, very early on in his life, 1957, it's published. 
Al-Ustas al-Islamiyah and Hizb al-Dawah. This is the, uh, what he penned as the constitution for the Islamic Dawah Party. The two other documents you have, the controversial one, uh, Lamha, uh, I've got the full name earlier, but basically it's a letter. Lebanese scholars wrote to him, what do you think should happen in Iran as the Islamic Revolution has just started? And so he writes a letter back, giving them advice on what they should do in, in, this, in, in, in Iran. And then finally, the third most important document for me is published in March 1979, Khilafat al-Insan al-Shahdat al-Athiyah. Lamha al faqhiya was a letter, literally, it's written in a very kind of non-academic style, full of rhetoric, full of praise for Imam Khomeini's revolution and its success. You, you read Khilafat al-Insan al-Shahdat al-Athiyah, and it's a booklet, it's academic, it's back to his usual style of, of explaining his theory. Three types of Islamic state from all of this we pull out. Infallible, fallible, and deviating fallible. Infallible is easy. You have a masoom, it's easy. Things, things go well because he's got away. We don't need to talk about that. Our focus is the fallible state and the so-called deviating fallible state. They're both the states that we have in the period of labor. Imam al-Mahdi's absence, we try to run our affairs in the way that we do. So, what are the ingredients for the Islamic State? We've already seen some of them. You have on the one, one circle here, Islamic values, culture, and spirit. This is the founding bedrock. You need to have the values, you need to have the society for it. You have policy and you have fixed Islamic law. So fixed Islamic law that can be clarified by the Majaiya and, and other Islamic legal experts, they're telling us, look, A, B, and C, this is black and white, you don't need to debate it. And then policy is where um, you have the legislature legislate on. We'll see that clearly there's parallels between this and a constitutional democracy. The two important concepts are Khilafah and Shahada. Um, Shahid Sadr starts with the story of the creation of man. He says, Look, this is where the story all begins. Allah has created an, an, a, a mankind, given them freedom, uh, and, and, and with responsibility, of course. And so that's, that, that's where the origin of the Shura concept comes from. But the unique thing about his interpretation, lots of people have kind of commented on, 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 on the Shura concept, but where he's unique is that he extrapolated two lines of authority. One that he called the line of Khilafah, and the other that he called the line of Shahada. Basically, these two lines, one is Khilafah, which is the actual governing, the, other, the second is Shahada, which is the supervisor. These two lines are combined in the presence of a prophet. Ma'asun. In the absence of a prophet, this is where it's unique. Shaykh al says we need to have separation of powers. The difference being, a marja, however amazing a marja is, can always err. A marja is fallible, he's not infallible. So um, you separate these two, and shahada becomes the responsibility of maraja, khilafah becomes the responsibility of the ummah. This is the, the, the founding bedrock of, of where democracy comes in. The right of Khilafah, he says, is conferred to all of humanity, and notice the link to history, and it is a movement that does not stop because it's directed towards the infinite. Now, this is an interesting point here. He's saying that in the period of Ghaybah, you can have an Islamic state of sorts that's ruled by people, and they will make mistakes. They'll pass legislation that goes wrong, and things will be messy, but it's part of that march towards the absolute. It's fine. It's part of that positive, optimistic vision. And the key point of distinction, as I've already made, is between prophets and, and, and grand jurists. And he talks a lot about that, actually. Shahada. Now, this is where the theory of political action comes from. He says, um, Shahada operates in different ways. I've created this table just to summarize it. The founding assumption is that we have to have an Islamic society. Without an Islamic society, we don't have any, anything. There's no forcing people. Then you have the uh, Islamic state here. Basically, there's three modes of operating. Think about it this way. If you have an Islamic society, but you don't have a state that's Islamic, you have a dictatorial state, you are in what can be described as a crisis mode. People are being oppressed. Clearly, he's talking about Iraq here. He's talking about previously Iran and other countries of the region. In that context, you have Khilafa and Shahada becoming the chief responsibility of the Majaya. Notice, the powers that he's given here is literally like a wali of fucking model. But it's only in that context because of the prudential reasons we've already discussed. People can't organize themselves, political parties are being crushed, 
Someone has to take responsibility. Someone has to take the leadership. For shade al Sadr, it has to be the Majid. But now, the moment you've made the transition, and now you have the Islamic State, and that's modes two and three, suddenly things change. Now, if you have a normal society, no crisis mode, things are operating normally, you have a separation of powers. Shahada becomes non-interventionist, he says. The Majid falls into the background and gives the usual guidance and the usual instructions, nothing to interventionist. You can also have a more interventionist role. Notice we said that there's three types of Islamic state. I talked about infallible state, I talked about fallible. I mentioned also deviating fallible. Deviating fallible is basically the argument that a fallible state, a government, can suddenly start doing things wrong. But then some things are worse than others. Imagine you have a democratically elected leader who starts to pass more and more authoritarian rules. It reaches a point for Shaykh al-Sadr where you need to start intervening. That type of intervention is, for instance, a fatwa. Binding fatwa, for instance. That's, a, that's warning the, the political leader. Now, it, it's funny, if you read this kind of crisis that he's describing, he's, again, his context is very clearly Iraq. In Iraq, you have years of governments being overthrown by militaries and, and dictatorships and whatever. So literally, his focus is on this, uh, the, 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 the danger of uh, tyrannical sort of tendencies from governments, and that's what he wants to stop, and, and so he has this element of interventionist shahada operating. So, what does the overall structure of the Islamic State look like? The head of the state, you can have a grand jurist, symbolic ceremonial powers. The executive, he says preferably presidential format, directly elected from the people. The legislative is by camera. This is a really interesting point. You have a lower chamber that's elected from the people, and then you have a higher chamber that's, he, he says things like, you can have spiritualists and lecturers and, and all sorts of kind of people. Essentially, if you look at it, it's like the upper chamber here in the UK, the House of Lords. Um, then you have the judiciary. The judiciary within it includes ulama, etc. So you can have that kind of Islamic concept of preserving al-ahkam. And then you have a marja'iyya that's kind of civil society organization actively playing a role, but sometimes having to intervene if it must. I think that may well be it. Yeah, I've stopped. Um, I'm going to stop speaking. How much time do you have? 20, 25 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to actually leave it to you. I can either talk about some of the gaps and weaknesses, or we can literally open up the discussion and have the gaps and weaknesses as part of the debate. It's, I don't know. Should we do that? Should I stop talking? Probably bored everyone to death. Okay, so um, microphone, or how, how do we do this? Okay, um, I'll, I'll just literally open it to the floor. You have... Absolutely full rights. If you need clarifications, I've gone through a lot of material. Or if you want to, if you already have a view and you want to challenge things, we can get into it as well. well uh, first of all, thank you very much for your academic style talk, which is not uh, always happening. And uh, second is that uh, I think Mohammed Bagher Sadr was. Uh, under two kinds of influences. One, uh, the idea of ideology by Ikhwan al-Muslimin and Jamaat Islami, which existed before Muhammad Baghar Saad, and they tried to make ideology out of Islam. And two is just confrontation against Marxism. And again, that also imposed uh, on Muslims to create a rival ide ideology. I think uh, many of his uh, ideas are essentially his, uh, his own. In other words, uh, is, I mean, anyone can come up with an idea, say, well, this is Islamic, but it's not really an Islamic state or an Islamic uh, economic system, but uh, his own ideas about how a state should run. And then as he has uh, very clearly mentioned, uh, most of it is mantaratul farq. In other words, uh, does, uh, in Iran maybe something else, in Iraq maybe something else, Egypt is something else. 
And this is not really Islamic. This is the will of the people. This is the just ideas generated by people. It has nothing to do with Islam. I, first of all, do not believe that uh, Islam is a comprehensive ideology. And the um, uh, reason that it became like so was as uh, historical because of uh, confrontation with the West, uh, Marxism, etc. They felt that something is wrong, like Ikhwan uh, al felt that uh, Islam has everything, you know, and they felt that if uh, it doesn't have an economic system, then something's wrong with the religion. Uh, so uh, they try to make a comprehensive uh, thing, as if, you know, you have Islamic mathematics, Islamic physics, is Islamic chemistry, Islamic, you know, state, Islamic economics, etc. You know, we have uh, ethical values in economics. We don't have an economic system. Once I remember before revolution, I asked the uh, uh, well, I probably should not mention his name. He's now a marja in Rom. Uh, uh, I asked him to come to our university and give a talk about the uh, economic system of Islam. He thought about it and he said, uh, although he had done a lot of work and he was famous for being an expert on economic Islam, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, why? He said, if I do come and give a talk about economic system, then the students will find out that Islam has no economic system. All right, and so, uh, so in other words, he came to the conclusion there is no such a thing as economic system. Of course, some say, well, it's, you know, it's uh, more towards socialism, some is uh, more towards capitalism, some say it's a mixture of the two, you know, this and that, and then uh, ultimately there's you come to Iran uh, after 30 odd years and still the banking system gives more interest than the Western, uh, all right? So, uh, and then they still call it the economic system, they still call it, you know, Islamic State, etc. I mean, uh, I think the best expression is that uh, Muslims, because of their culture, because of the traditions, you know, of course, you know, when you have democracy, they elect people and then they can do whatever they can, but, what is obvious is that you should not deviate from some ethical values. You know, that is essentially Islamic, just the akhlaq, not, we don't have economics, we don't have state, we don't have politics, and these are all uh, your own ideas. And Muhammad Bagarsad was a genius of creating many ideas or uh, trying to give uh, some of the fatwas of the ulama, etc., some uh, uh, form of uh, political or economic or philosophical type of things. Uh, so this is essentially my view. And uh, you go to Iraq, again, it's the same thing, you know. Uh, again, uh, it's the power politics, you know, everything else in Iran is the same thing, you know, no matter where you go. And you can call it whatever you wish. And now, unfortunately, when they call it Islamic, a lot of people get uh, disappointed and just they stay away from, say, if this is Islam, then just, you know, forget about it. And uh, I think uh, we should stay away from these views and uh, concentrate on Irfan and Akhlaq. And, and when you become a president, when you become a prime minister, when you become the head of a bank, then you follow some of the ethical values. Essentially, that's what Islamic State is. Two more questions and comments? And then Any more questions? Ali? I've got two, oh, well, don't know how quick they are. Um, first thing is, how sure are we that we are sh sure that about what was going in inside, say, Muhammad Bakr Sadr's head? I mean, the tragedy is he died early and his ideas didn't really mature, as you, I think, rightly pointed out, and it's reflected in the sort of the lack of textual uh, uh, references we've got to work on, and it's also reflected as to how people sort of interpret it, obviously. Um, so my question is, I know you've, you've, you, you've, you've presented your view, and I think it's, it's, it's quite a uh, valid view. But again, how, how much can we actually base it on? Say Muhammad Bakr Sadr and the rest of it, is it just coming from where, how we choose to interpret it? And the second question is, given this sort of uh, lack of clarity, how much, what, what's its potential in the current time? Because I agree, it's a product of its time. Um, you know, as, he, as, as the brother rightly pointed out, that you know, he was you know under the pressure from the communists, and also there was lots of different 
sort of ideas floating around. So it's a, in many ways a, lo a reaction to what was going on at the time. Is there a potential for it to really actually be progressed and actually have any sort of uh, validity in our present time? One more question. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Um, well, I've been studying for years. Um, quite come clear to me that it's no such a thing as uh, Islamic State. Uh, Islam itself provides a lot for mankind. We don't need European um, ideologies such as the state bring it into Islam. And also um, democracy. What's democracy? It starts from India which is fade away, and Islam entered, and the people in India was quite happy, so we don't need that, got nothing to do with Islam. But uh, what's interesting about Islam can adopt any idea. Prophet Muhammad said, pursue knowledge even if it's in China. So we can grow, we can use the knowledge of other uh, sort of a nation of the mankind, but give it the Islamic color. Um, and I'm just thinking, when is the Maraja gonna to uh, find that time to do it. Prophet Muhammad started and left it to our hands, and it's quite not logical to think that Imam Mahdi is going to come and do it all. It is us who is going to do it. The preparation is for him. And I think um, Baqar Sadr went wrong in many ways, but we certainly have beautiful economy in Islam. We don't use it. This is the problem with the Muslim. Thank you for all those questions and comments. Um, the first, the first set of comments on kind of, do we have an Islamic system or not? Um, I think it's a very, very valid critique, very valid question. Um, it's not for me, apologies, it's not for me to kind of um, respond on behalf of Shahid al-Sadr, what he would say, I have absolutely no idea. Um, He's not alive with us, unfortunately, today to have that debate. But you're absolutely right. The critique stands that Shahid al-Sadr's views were very much shaped by communism. You see it very clearly in Aqtasaduna. It's, it's an attempt in Falsafatuna. Uh, communism was spreading in Najaf. Even some sons of Maraja were becoming communists. So that threat is very, very visible. In fact, my interpretation when I was reading so much of this stuff is that it's so visible that he spent so much time reading about communism, he didn't give enough attention to Western political discourse other than that. And so you, you get a very skewed uh, view of democracy. So for instance, there's this problematic quote that I didn't talk about, where he says, um, basically, um, so Islam takes all the good things about democracy and adds to it objectivity, et cetera, et cetera. So people are like, well, he's clearly not pro-democracy. Look at what he's saying. He's saying it's, it's, it's not good enough. Well, you actually analyze what he then goes on to say and then all the other examples where he's ever criticized democracy. And it's basically what he's criticizing is minority rule. It's, sorry, majority rule. The idea that a majority can simply overturn um, the rights of a minority. That's what he's protesting against. And literally the example that he gives in that same, that people stop reading up until that line, is literally, guys, if you have uh, a majority voting in to decide, let's take away the rights of minority. For Islam, that's not good enough, because these rights are fundamental. The rights of freedom and self-respect and humanity, human dignity. So um, going back, is he influenced by communism and the threat of communism? Absolutely, that's clear. Uh, that's clearly the context. For me, that meant that it did kind of injustice in terms of his, the amount of time he did on Western political discourse. But beyond kind of saying that, I can't say, um, you know, there is no such thing as, as, uh, as an Islamic state or there is no such thing as an Islamic system. It's, it's there for debate. You know, I, I haven't made up my mind on this yet, to be honest. Um, that's the first question. The second is how sure are we? Um, I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna go on the weaknesses. Um, I think that at least I'm very confident that you can make out a lot of what Shahid al-Sadr is saying. Um, I don't want to go down in, into details of looking at the authors, but they clearly don't, a lot of them adopt kind of systematic, academic, let's look at the texts. So if you look at, this is the one example I give because it's not 
a critique of what is actual interpretation of text. Shaykh Muhammad Baqir Hakim's article, a journal article on the subject, one reference to Shaykh al-Sadr's works, academics. His argument of he changed his mind is purely p political. His argument is that um, basically he started to have doubts and then Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim al-Marja had a chat with him and told him that, you know, what are you doing? This is, this is wrong. He was influenced by this view and thus he quit Hizb al-Dawah and, and, and Shaykh al-Sadr did indeed quit Hizb al-Dawah. And that quit, uh, the decision to quit was his decision to break away from his ideas. His whole argument is not based on texts. His argument is based on events, which then other scholars have disputed. So it becomes a debate between them. For me, I just stepped back. I was like, okay, so long as it's not the text, I can't do much with it. I actually looked at the chronology and found some flaws, but that's a different kind of discussion. If you actually look at the documents, they say a lot. What they don't say enough about, and this is where I think your question is bang on, it's where does the Khilafah Shahada distinction, how can you draw the lines? And I'm sure you know this already, you've probably debated it with lots of people and, and, and kind of read about it. My uh, response to that is the following. Firstly, think of the US and think of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court uh, has the responsibility to protect the Constitution. And yet, ask any scholar of, of law and politics, yes, the Supreme Court, uh, the US has a written constitution, but much of its so-called kind of constitutional heritage is not written. In the UK, we don't even have a codified constitution. We have loads of various documents and lots of tradition. And yet, we still say that the Supreme Courts in the UK and the US can play a role, a supervisory role. Well, it takes a bit of kind of, mm, maybe we should step in here, maybe we should step in there. And so there is that, I think, flexibility, even in Western political systems, that we have to, uh, that we have to kind of take account of. And this is one of, one of the possible answers. This is not saying, I'm not saying Shayda Sadr answers this. I'm just reflecting on that question of, why don't we have enough about this Khilaf al-Shahada? One is that, you know what, he, he, he believed in people, he believed in their rationality, he believed in the positive role of Marjai, and he thought, they'll figure it out, it's not a big deal. Maybe that's too idealistic. But then the other obvious reason is this. Shaykh al-Sadr was executed one year after uh, Khilafat al-Insan or Shahadat al-Anbiya was published. Exactly one year. You look at that one year and it was a year full of arrests and torture and ultimately execution him and, and, and his sister at the age of 45. So is his theory incomplete? Perhaps. But I don't think it doesn't exist. I think you can clearly see his opinions from some of these key texts if you read through them. But I, I, th I think there's a very strong case to say he just did not have enough time to, to fully um, kind of explain uh, his ideas. Potential for current time, clearly we can develop those ideas if we believe in them. We can start having that debate of what are the fundamental elements of Islam, what, what are the elements, what does it mean to, uh, is it okay for a Muslim society to have an elected government and have that government make mistakes um, uh, that ultimately compromise the image of Islam, is that okay? You know, are we okay with that? Or do we just say, you know what, we don't really have the capacity to lead in the name of Islam, let's give up, withdraw completely, is that, is that an answer? Is it a sort of, okay, let's not withdraw and let's not, let's do alliances with kind of Westerners or with, if, if it's in the case of Iraq, whatever, non-Islamists and, and, you know, cover it up that way and claim we're governing in the name of nationalism or whatever it is. It's for, it's for debate. It's definitely for debate. I think it's very difficult to, to say either way. Um, there's no such thing as the Islamic State system. You made lots of really important points about kind of that journey. I think this is part of the reason why I'm very, uh, I'm very much a big fan of Shaykh al-Sadr, is that he did absolutely believe in that vision that you were talking about, that it's our responsibility to develop knowledge and to discover more and more about the world. Um, some people question whether it exists or not, but I think that uh, this is the, the amazing thing, that he did take sometimes Western concepts and he thought, okay, how can we make them Islamic? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's people who say, oh, democracy is a Western concept. Well, yes and no. If you look at it thousands of years, every single idea happens through discussion and debate amongst thinkers and intellectuals. There's no such thing as a British idea. There's no such thing as an American idea. So why are we so sensitive to democracy? I think we're sensitive to democracy due to political factors, because it was exported by colonialists who used it to bash our heads in, and so we hate it. It's not because of the democracy itself is such a controversial concept. Now, if there's specific verses in the Quran, moreover, that seem to very much agree with lots of these ideas, then who are we to say whether they're Eastern or Western? For me, they're universal. 
they're not the preview of just Islam. Any r religion or, in fact, any atheist who doesn't believe in religion can still have an opinion and can still, can still debate these ideas. Um, a couple more questions. Yep. Uh, got three questions. I'm myself muddled up in my head, so I'll try and put it in, my, in words. Uh, I, know, I realize that Saddam was a tyrant and time was, time was very difficult that time. Uh, was there an opportunity or was there an effort made by Bakr al-Sadr to engage with Saddam's ulamas to discuss his ideas? Uh, that's the first. The second is... Can you, sorry, clarify, what do you mean by Saddam's ulamas? Well, wh whoever the, the, the leading scholars of Saddam's thought, school of thought were, or, or with Saddam, for example. You okay. Know, what I mean is the Sunni school, basically. You mean Sunni school, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Uh, the second is... I, I gathered from what you spoke was the fact that uh, he changed his ideology with, with time in the sense that he believed later on that uh, there's no point in changing the government, but in change needs to come from the masses. Now, how much time did he have to implement this theory and, did he, and what did he actually do about this? And thirdly, did he have a view? Uh, can I just stop you there? Just, uh, can we keep it to a maximum of two per person just because there are quite a lot of people asking right. questions and we don't have that much time left? Um, Thank you, brother. I uh, feel that, uh, you know, what he was coming to, especially in terms of political theory, has been tried, tested, and found wanting in Iran, right? And in Iran or Iraq? Iran. Iran, Iran. Iran. Yeah, because very similar. Islamic. Um, now, you look at the case of the fallible state, right? Um, you see, the problem has been that although in theory uh, everybody accepts that the merger is fallible, in practice, if you try to find out one fault of the merger, you are out. See? So that's one big problem, right? Only Ayatollah Naini recognizes that fallibility in essence and wants to embed it into constitutional law, right? Not, not only that, Shaykh Tassad wanted as well. Yeah, yeah, he wanted, but he's still not showing in his works this appreciation of the debate in Iran around the turn of the 20th century on Mashrutiyat and Mashruiyat, yeah? yeah? The uh, constitutionalism and Sharia. The other problem is that although we talk about separation of powers, because the judiciary is essentially subservient to the Marjaya, the judiciary is not able to rule against the Marjaya, even if some of them make mistakes. And essentially that destroys the separation, right? Or even not rule against people whom they think will not be favored by the Marjaya, yes? And over and over we have seen in Iran that the judiciary has been rendered completely useless because it, it just feels that it will not be accepted. So there is that, these are the two big problems in this theory, where I think he didn't, Shaydi Sadr didn't have time to really, and the, of course, practical uh, lessons from what can happen yeah. to go there. In terms of systems, I, I think it's semantic, whether you call it, uh, whether we have an Islamic system or economic system, Islamic or not, the main idea is that we have certain fundamental values which are embedded, right? And so if you look at not works like the sadhana, which are essentially uh, an anti-Marxist uh, you know, document, that's not different. But if you look at, say, things like Mankler Rabovia, okay, where he puts forward explicit building principles of what he thinks an Islamic economy may look like in that time. This is not f fixed for every time. This is for this time, right? So he's not saying this is an Islamic system. He said these are the minimal things which we need. This is how we proceed to get them embedded into society. It's not enough to say that ethical values are sufficient. What happens if people don't follow ethical values? You need a structure to enforce them and embed them. And that's what his contribution mainly is. Take one more as well. Um, you differentiate between, or Sadr differentiates between Ahkam al Thabit and Ta'alim. I don't know how to pronounce that. No, no. um, um, did he kind of expand on that and talk about what's included in that? 
um, because that would be quite interesting as to what he thinks is kind of fixed and um, fixed kind of for all time and what is kind of up to the people and kind of this free space where people can kind of work it out themselves. Yep. Okay, um, I'll link that to the question um, uh, earlier about kind of uh, the um, separation of powers, did it exist or not? Um, I'll start with the first two questions. Um, was there an opportunity to engage? I think it's absolutely unfair to uh, say Sunni ulama, particularly Saddam's ulama. I'm sure that wasn't the kind of understanding there. Anyone can read about Saddam. He was essentially a brutal dictator. We don't need to go into details, but that was ideologically corrupt. You take Hitler, he took the so-called National Socialist Party and then converted it into a killing machine. Saddam took Hizb al-Ba'ath. Some people say Hizb al-Ba'ath is built to kill people and whatever, maybe. But even if you think Hizb al-Ba'ath is okay, ultimately the first thing Saddam did was chop all the opposition in Hizb al-Ba'ath and then in a famous video you can see, he says, Tal'u barra, go out, go out, go out, and he names people. And everyone else is so scared of him, they're clapping. And, go, and when they go out, they go shoot them. So Saddam killed his killed uh, Ba'athis first, then killed the communists, then confronted the Shia. So um, kind of confusing th that with the ulama, Shahid al-Sadr had a great relationship with Sunni ulama more general, in general. So you have letters being exchanged with uh, um, Al-Azhar and, and other scholarship. That can be kind of studied on its own. No point in changes, uh, changing the masses, theory of political. I think you're referring, I don't know if I understood this correctly, I think you're referring to that kind of political action. It's, it's, I was saying it's not that he doesn't believe that government needs to be changed. He's just changed his opinion for practical reasons on how do we bring about that change. So initially, if you're, you know, he's optimistic and he thinks you can just bring it about through normal political action, organizing the masses, and, 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 and that's how you bring about change, then he realizes, wait, we're not living in a democracy. That's not possible. So you need someone to actually take the leadership, and that's where he says you bring in the marjaya. Um, great points um, uh, regarding kind of weaknesses of his theory. I think where I disagree is you characterized it as being tried and tested as in Iran. I don't think it was. I think the, uh, my analysis of uh, Lamha, in fact, the very letter for me, the way he wrote it, is he's trying to challenge Khomeini's ideas politely. So the letter's 18 and a half pages. Literally a third of it is saying how amazing uh, the revolution is. But then you look at the fundamentals. What is he doing? For uh, the Iranian regime and kind of the theoretical con kind of concept of Walat al Faqih, Mantaqat al Faragh, the area of space, you can't fill it in, the people don't fill it in. Yes, the, uh, procedurally they can, but ultimately the authority to fill it in is in the hands of the Marjaya. For Shahid al Sadr, there's a separation of power, theoretically. We can talk about the challenge of actually implementing it. But so I think there's important theoretical. P points of difference for him. Now, the, the practical challenge is uh, regarding judiciary, I think, is a very live one. It's being debated in Iraq today. What do you do about this, the judiciary and the Supreme Court, and how, and how do you create it? I think that we, we ultimately don't know where Shahid al Sadr will stand because we don't have enough information. But there's interesting hints. So, in Iran, he's, he's talking in the context of the revolution, two weeks after Imam Khomeini has landed in and, and been heralded. And he says that you need to have a second chamber that includes, maybe he says, a hundred spiritualists. And it includes intellectuals. And it includes, you know, a bunch of experts. And then, you know, a few clerics. For me, there's a clear, if you look at his life, but that's my interpretation. There's a clear desire not to have things run and administered by the marjaya. But the fundamental theoretical question is absolutely on the question Sister Khadija raised, which is ahkam al-thabita and um, ta'alim. That's the difficulty. If you look at al-usus, which is where he initially starts to talk about it, he basically says, he doesn't go into too much detail, but he basically says that al-ahkam al-thabita are very few clear basic concepts that we can glean from, from the Quran. For, for instance, how to pray. We don't need to debate it. It's very clear. The ahkam regarding a few basic concepts. Anything like economic policy, trade policy, whatever, uh, those kinds of things that, that change over time, these, are, these would fall under the, the kind of bucket of ta'alim. The problem is he did not delineate and clarify that distinction enough. I, for me, at least, my reading. That this is the whole would he have done it had he lived longer debate. Because it's only in that March publication that we have that he says Al-Khilafah very clearly is about 
منطقة الفراغ في لينكدين and the shahada is about making sure that the fundamental principles aren't so we don't have exactly what Shahid al-Sadr would say but why did I look, talk about the concepts this is someone who believes in man and reason this is someone who's optimistic whether we agree or disagree with him but if we're saying what is his opinion I think he wanted people to have as big a say as possible because he does believe that people are, uh, have the uh, capability to reason and, and to grow and, and to learn through kind of that process and so he has absolutely no problem with it happening through a kind of parliamentary chamber um, semantics, I agree, absolutely, <laughs> no comment on that. Uh, thank you very much, Afra, I think we'll end there. Muhammad wa'ala Muhammad salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.